Okay guys, um, this is Jim, and uh, Jim's currently in the box uh, at Central and Orange. And so I put my bags down there, and um, I put, uh, sorry, I don't know what you're seeing. I also put out the Rethink Homelessness sign, um, because I really support their campaign. That video rocks. If you haven't seen Cardboard Stories, you need to see it. But anyway, let's go meet Jim and Duke. This is Jim and Duke here. Hey, how's it going? Excuse me, excuse me. And uh, Jim and Duke are hanging out in the box on Central. How's it going, Jim? Just trying to make it. Why is it so hard to make it, man? It's like no one really cares. It's okay. like it's like no one really cares about the military and that happens to end up being out on the street. So you were military? U.S. Marine. How long did you were in the military? Still in. You're still in? Reserve. Oh, you're in the reserves. Were you on active duty? I was. How long? Back in 0102. 0102. Who's that you got with you down there? That's my best buddy, Duke. That's Duke. How long have you and Duke been out here? Uh, for, for about... How long have you been out here? Oh, I'm sorry. Just, for just about... Each and every day from, du from morning before sunrise till at night. No, but I mean, how many have you been out here a week or a month or a year or how long have you been on the streets, Jim, where nobody's been helping you? Pretty much about a couple months. Now, when you're sitting in this box, when people come by, they're always nice to you, right? They say hi and everything, but I, I never get the opportunity to come up with rent money. Okay. Do you have a job? You've had a. Are, are you? Do you have a job? I've I've done security work. Are you? Do you, will you work now? You want a job now? If I had a job right now, I'd be working. Oh. How do you feed Duke? Uh, pretty much. I got dog food uh, in my bag. Cool. Yeah. Other people uh, pay for like the canned, wet, moist food. So people help you out with food for Duke? At, like every other few days, yeah. Wow. Well, you know what, Jim? It's really nice to meet you, man. And hopefully we're gonna make you a lot of money in your box tonight, right? Isn't that our plan? I'm hoping so. All right, man, you take care. Hey, everybody. Hello. Okay, um, first we have to start out with class rules. I'm a teacher, so you have to follow the rules. Rule number one, um, I'll take all questions at the end, so please hold your questions. Rule number two is to learn. It's very important today um, that you really concentrate on the people that I'm going to introduce you to. not. I want to make sure that I say many, many times over, I am not here to indict anybody, blame anybody, throw anybody under the bus. I'm only here to tell you what it was like to be homeless. So maybe you can understand it. Maybe you can, when you're talking with your friends, explain to them what it's really like to be homeless. I only have put my credentials on the screen. This is my military history. I've only put it on the screen so you understand my background, so maybe you could put everything in context. One more time. I'm not going to go over this stuff. You know, you could look it up on the internet or whatever. Again, it's only so you understand the context of what I'm saying. I have had some great civilian jobs. I have had fun with a lot of people. 
a good friend of mine, Walt Willis, who runs Food Angels. Him and I go deliver food together to elderly. And uh, Debbie's here. Um, Debbie Thomas from Ministry of Hope. Uh, I won't even go over our history. The point is I've been very lucky with who I've gotten to minister with. And I don't mean that in a religious way. I mean it in a food way. And then finally I became a teacher. The reason I put all this stuff up there is only so you know that I personally believe that every moment in my life has prepared me for what I'm doing right now. When I started this project, it was started for my students. It was never supposed to take on this life. For those of you that aren't familiar with uh, reading and its uh, nuances, we worry, reading teachers do, that we teach the students all year, then they take two months off, and during that two months, they lose skills. Well, I didn't want my students to lose skills, and since my wife and I feed the homeless camps, my original idea was, what a great idea to get them engaged. I'll go homeless, I'll teach them empathy, and um, they'll have to read and write because I'll put it on Facebook and I'll be blogging about it. And they'll have to be engaged. Who would not want to see their teacher in a blue box? I don't know if you noticed the blue box here that's on the stage, but I'll get to that in a little while. Um, who wouldn't want to see their teacher eat out of a dumpster or stand with a will work for food sign or any of the other things that I had to uh, endure? So that's how this started. It took off. And here we are. Never intended to be here. Not to this magnitude. Um, I'll tell you, it's very difficult when I try to talk about this in a very calm manner. The things I was subjected to when I was homeless were worse than being in jail. Yeah, I've been there. Three days. I'd go back there for three days before I'd spend 20 minutes homeless. That's the truth. I was in the military, and many times um, I was in Damage Control Central, which controls all of the battle stations for the ship, and the captain would be standing over my shoulder, and I'd be running the battle problem. That was a lot of stress. That was really, I mean, and we're practicing for real, for nuclear weapons, for every possible contingency you can think of. I'd rather do that for a month than 20 minutes homeless. Now, both of those are extreme, but that's how bad it was. It really was bad. And I'm going to tell you all about the experience, but first I have to tell you, I could stand here for two hours and do statistics. Easily. Those have been put out in every newspaper. There's many advocates that have talked about all these things. But for some reason, well, let me back up a little bit. I know the reason. The reason is, the reason that happens is when you walk by something and you don't care about it, you don't notice it anymore. I put a post on Facebook about our family poem in our house. And I remember when we first put it up, I would see it every time I walked out the door. It's right by my front door. And I would see it every time. You know, I was just walking by, and I don't remember what day it was, a week or so ago, and I realized I don't even notice it anymore. It's because when I first put it up, I really cared about it. I was very proud that I painted it on the wall. It's kind of like when you get a new car. You buy a new Camaro, all of a sudden, every car on the road is a Camaro. You see every Camaro that's out there where you never noticed it before. <sighs> I'll tell you, I made a reference on Facebook about I wish I could take the blue pill. For those of you that don't understand that reference, it's a reference to the movie The Matrix, and the gentleman had a choice between a red pill and a blue pill. If he took the red pill, he would go find how messed up the world was and the phrase 
that the character Morpheus used was, you see how deep the rabbit hole goes. If he took the blue pill, he'd wake up the next day in his bed and not remember anything. Right back to his life. I wish I had taken the blue pill because I can't unlearn what I've learned. I had relationships with these people. I suffered with them for a month. And therefore, I personally know them. And I feel like I'm leaving them on the battlefield just standing here. If you've noticed, after I came home, I didn't take any time off. I wanted to, believe me. My wife definitely wanted me to. I can't. I literally can almost not sleep. It's that bad, what we're doing to human beings. I can honestly say to you, without exaggerating at all, that we treat animals better than we do the homeless. I looked at those swans at Lake Eola and I'd say, hmm, if I were to kick one of those swans, it'd be a felony. But if I kicked a homeless person, nobody'd care. And that's the truth. So this is all about a passion that I didn't even know I had. I'm going to go over some of these statistics. There's only uh, three slides, I believe, of statistics. And it's just so you have a background. Believe me, I could have filled 35 slides with statistics. These are the ones that mean the most to me. You know, they uh, had a council that they put together on homelessness. And they reported recently that there was a 17% drop statewide in Florida. That's a good thing, except <laughs> there was a 29% increase here in Orange County. Hmm, that doesn't seem very good to me. I don't know about you. I mean, to me, that seems ridiculous. Um, I put in the next note that this isn't surprising. That's because our community is known more for arresting the homeless than helping them. Is that the reputation that we want? It's not the reputation I want for the city beautiful. You know, I'm not the first guy to talk about this. There's advocates been doing this for years and years and years. I see some of them in the room right now. This is not new. anything I'm going to tell you right now. None of this is new information. None of it. In 2007 is when they made this commission. And they know what's going on. I don't know if they're trying to fight bureaucracy. Don't think I'm blaming this commission. Again, I'm not blaming anybody, but where we're at is ridiculous. I have a quote up here from Mr. Andre Bailey, who's the commissioner um, for the mayor on homelessness. He said, the time for leaders in this state and central Florida to deny reality is coming to an end. That was a long time ago. I submit to you that today is the end. Because hopefully, you know, originally I was going to put this video from this event, this little speech today, um, up on iTunes and try to raise some money for the charities. I don't think that's a good idea anymore because I don't want anybody to be limited for what I'm getting ready to show you. So we're going to put it on YouTube and we're going to put it on Facebook and we're going to mail CDs to every American. I'm kidding. Um, the point is, I want everybody to know about this. So, let's talk a little bit about what's the smart fiscal decision. Even if you have no desire to help people, even if you're willing to let people suffer, as a business person, I'll let you read up there, but it's this simple. It costs us three times as much for what we're doing now. Three times. So, what politician can look at you and say, I don't want to save 66%. Don't let them say it. These are not my figures. And believe it or not, <coughs> you can see the numbers up, 31,000 and 10,000. But believe it or not, this doesn't even include some money. So really the figure is bigger. It doesn't include... Um, Nonprofit agencies that feed all the people that have food programs. Um, it, um, I'll let you read it up there. But I do want to say this because Mr. Gregory Shin did put this quote and it's very important. It says, 
this is the only money that we could document for the individuals we studied, and it's money that's simply being wasted. 66% of our money is being wasted. All the people in here. The law enforcement costs alone are ridiculous. It's out of control. It is out of control, people. It definitely is out of control. The expense of what we're doing is ridiculous. And here's what's even more ridiculous. Most people think if you have a problem, you just go to a shelter and they let you stay there. That's not the way it works. Our city does not have enough beds. And, that, and neither does Osceola County. You can see the numbers up there. They don't have enough beds. So how can all these people just go get a bed? They, could, they can't. Is that the Salvation Army's problem? No. Is it the Coalition for the Homeless's problem? No. Is it a mission problem? Those are the three main shelters. No. It's a community problem. While we're talking about that community problem, I want to tell you something that really concerns me that I hope we start working on today. The Coalition for the Homeless had a 300 bed wet shelter. Okay? And this 300 bed wet shelter, I think everybody would agree, even the people at the Coalition, that it was pretty dangerous. You, you, I mean, you had to really have a jail mentality as somebody that worked there to even get anything done with the folks that were coming in. People were coming in intoxicated. Um, you know, there was so much on the news about it. Well, what they said is, we want a better program. So they built a 250 bed shelter that's all residential. So basically, they took 300 overnight flop for a dollar beds and they turned it into 250 residential program beds. Here's the problem. As a community, this is not the coalition's problem. It's not their job to make sure we have enough. It's not their job. It's the community's job. It's the city's job. They basically made a huge upgrade for our homeless community. But here's the problem. We still have 300 overnight beds that went away. And for those of you that were in Orlando last year, the news said, depending on which station you want to quote, that between 120, I believe it was, and 200 people were on the streets last year. Once we filled each shelter to fire marshal capacity, they turned away somewhere between 120 and 200 people. Wow. How many are in here? Maybe 50, 60. So, Four times the number of people that are in here slept on the street in the cold last year. And every shelter tried to do everything they could. They filled it. I mean, they had people laying on the floors. They filled it to capacity. Well, now we've lost 300 beds. So let's do a little math together, class. 300 beds lost. 120, we'll use the low side. We're going to have 440 people sleep on the ground. Now, I've talked to a lot of people about that. And a lot of people are saying, well, no, a lot of the 300-bed people went into the 250-bed shelter. That is true. It did happen. I talked to those people. A lot of them are my friends. Believe me, I've interviewed people coming out of every shelter because they were all my friends, not because I went and sought them out. I know the reasons they left programs, and that's not even important. What's important is we're going to have 400 people on the street this year, and nobody cares. There is a moratorium in the city of Orlando to increase any social service in the Paramore area. And depending on who's interpreting the law, maybe the city. So how do we fix this? Because in Orlando, Mayor Dyer had a state of the city address. And in his address, thumbs up to him. I mean... We're getting ready to house a whole big group of people, 300 people, in permanent supportive housing, which is what these folks need. But the problem is, that's only 300 people. Nobody should be subjected to what I'm getting ready to show you. Nobody. Researchers estimated that if we took that math of three times the amount and extrapolated, 
that we would save 149 million dollars in the next decade. So why aren't we doing that? I'll tell you why. Awareness. Awareness. Just like the poem on the wall, it's not that people, if they knew what was going on, would walk by it. Everybody in Orlando, this is a great community. But when you're not thinking about it, you do walk by it. And our apathy has allowed leaders to do this to our people. So, in 2011, we had about uh, 6,583 homeless. Remember, these aren't my statistics. I'll talk about what I think about statistics a little later. All of these were pulled out of reports, by the way, these first three slides. And once I get done with this, then we're really going to talk homelessness. So there's 3,000 children attending Orange County Public Schools that are homeless. And that number has doubled since 2008. Are we doing a good job? Obviously not. The poverty rates among schools in Orange County increased 60%. The poverty rate of those families increased 60% in that same time period. And in 2010, 17% of the population is food insecure. That's where Second Harvest Food Bank comes in. I'll tell you, they do a bang up job of getting all the stuff from Walmarts and every place that, you know, their food's going to spoil and redistributing. They do a great job of that. Here's what upset me. SNAP, which is the new food stamp program. I looked at the statistic and it said 55%, over half, are children and seniors. So, I don't know about you, that doesn't seem right to me. And then when you look at the one in five Orlando residents aren't insured, so let's, let's get this straight. They're on food stamps. They don't have any insurance. I could paint the picture, but you're getting it. Here's a sad, very sad statistic from last year. 7,234 students were identified in home, as homeless in Orange County. In our school system. 7,000 children. What, well, what? I mean, what does it take for people to see what's happening. I only put this up here because it really frustrates me. I want to tell you that everybody's definition of homelessness is different depending on what they want to do. When they count people, they do it a different way than when they're talking about finance. And I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of that. It'd be a waste of our time. The point is, I want you to see something. You know, the homeless are not just the people. <coughs> They're on the streets downtown. The homeless are the ones you never see in camps. The homeless are those that are living in hotels because their family can't get into an apartment. The homeless are people that are couch surfing. You don't see those people. They're still homeless. None of those people are counted. I'm not even gonna go over this. I just wanted you to see who they count as homeless and who they count as not homeless. Can you go to the next one, please? So many things are happening to the homeless because they're homeless. They don't have a voice. They have a voice actually, but nobody listens. I watched a video on the internet where they had a gentleman dress up as homeless, fall on the ground, and literally cry for help. It's on my Facebook page. Many, 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 so many people walk by me. He was actually out loud crying for help. He then went and put on a suit or nice clothes, whichever it was, I don't remember exactly, and did it in the exact same place at the exact same time of day. It didn't take two seconds for somebody to be over to him. People are afraid of the homeless, and they shouldn't be.
Now, I, I've talked about what I saw as far as who I think is homeless. People in hotels, people on people's floors, all of that stuff. Now let's talk about something I coined. This phrase is not out of any book. It's who's responsibly homeless. You know what? Do you see this young lady right here? That young lady was in the coalition with me when I was there. And I guarantee when you walk by on the street, you'd think she was a doctor, a lawyer, or anything else. Look how nice she's dressed. She is immaculately clean. You would never know she's homeless. Here's the problem. The homeless that are smoking K2 or drinking beer or doing those things are the ones you notice. They give all the homeless a bad name. Okay? Laura, come on up here. Everybody, this is Laura that spent 24 hours with me. What a gritty young lady. Okay. Uh, the reason I brought Laura up here is is when she asked, <laughs> it's funny how all this happened because I'll tell you the truth, I didn't think anybody would come out with me for 24 hours. I just put it on the Facebook page so people would quit telling me I was cheating. She took me up on the offer. And um, so when she came out, uh, I gave her one task. Do you remember what that task was, Laura? To count how many people I met that were either on drugs or drunk. Yeah, I had her put a tick mark for every person she met and every person she met that she thought was on any substance. I told her to look for orange fingers for K2, smell for alcohol, see if they see if they slur the words. If you think they're on any substance, you can sit back down where sorry. Um, if you, and she didn't know I was gonna call her up either. I just needed to give her her props for getting out on the street. Um, check this out. Everybody thinks the homeless are a bunch of drunks and drug addicts, but the truth is, the percentage of homeless that use substances is half of society. Regular society has plenty of money to go buy a six pack on the way home. The homeless don't. You just think it's a big percentage because that's the people you notice. Laura, if I'm not mistaken, 120 plus you met. And how many were, it was like 12 or something like that? or how many? Two that were obvious and like three that we were told. Okay, so real low numbers. You see what I'm saying? Huh. <coughs> Responsible homeless people aren't using drugs. You're never going to know they're homeless. You went backwards on me. One more. Sorry, guys. So, you know, this is a good opportunity because I have to tell you, I don't feel very comfortable right now. While I'm doing this, what's laying over here is what I actually wore when I was homeless. When I left Lake Eola, all I had was my ID card, my phone, and my charger. Is that right, honey? This. Did I take a dollar? No, you did not. I did. And um, I had no idea what I was getting into. None. No idea whatsoever. I thought that after talking to the homeless people in the camps and stuff, that I had a pretty good idea of what they went through. I was way wrong. No idea. Let me tell you, it's brutal what they do. It's extremely brutal to the point that I can't even stand it for a few minutes. One more slide, please. That's the same two slides that keep coming up. That's all that's left? Are you kidding? There we go. He's waiting on me like this. Sorry, my first speech. And this isn't supposed to be so hard. Here's the thing. I don't feel comfortable in a tux. That's not me. Never has been. Never will be. No matter how long I do this, this is not the way I feel comfortable. You know what? 
I know I'm going to take all kinds of grief for this, but that's just the way it is. Don't think that this bag is on there for effect. I didn't have any tape, so I used the Publix bag, and the reason it comes up this way is so the strings hold it so it doesn't slide off, so my shoe will stay together. And these shoes were brand new before I left, $29.97 at Walmart. That's what they look like now. I've posted pictures of what they looked like in the, in the beginning. Don't worry, it's not a strip show. <laughs> so he's trying to make a little box of money. Now, the way you see me right now, <laughs> better get the mic or my eyes going to yell at me. The way you see me right now is what a homeless person would look like after they had worked their bottoms off, <laughs> stunk for four to five days, and earned enough money to get a hotel room. That's how they stay clean, uh, aside from all the things I'm getting ready to tell you. Mainly, we try to earn enough money to get a hotel room. And I don't know if it's really for the shower, because they can get showers other places. I think it's more just to feel normal. Be able to turn on the TV when you want, and feel safe. You never feel safe when you're homeless. Never. It doesn't even matter if you're in the safest place in the city. You never, ever, for one second, feel safe. <laughs> so I have to apologize right now to Tracy Morris, who's sitting in the crowd, and Sasha. And I, um, Mr. Roach is here from Orange County Public Schools. Those were my three sponsors. I couldn't put on Facebook that I was dining and dashing, but I did at all those places up there. It's not a joke. Did I do it for a campaign? No. Here's what I want you to think about for a minute. If you've ever been hungry, really hungry, wait 12 hours after that. Then walk by somebody's cell phone without stealing it when you need something to eat. You can't. You physically can't. You want to know why your survival instinct kicks in and you're willing to do whatever it takes to survive and that's the way it's always going to be. So are they dishonest? No, they're desperate. Now there are some that are dishonest. Of course in every group there's dishonesty. There's drug users, there's everything. But the truth is, they're just desperate. I can tell you I had my teaching license on the line every time I dined and dashed. I did not do it with impunity. I did it to survive. And by the way, just for those of you that don't really, um, well, let me just say this. I went back and paid all of them, of course. Next slide. <laughs> where I slept. Oh, gosh. You know, if people really knew what I did, I think um, all three of my sponsors would have gotten rid of me on day four and I wouldn't have gotten any further. But where did I sleep? This is a bed between an air conditioner and the wall of the store. That's where I slept. If the police had seen me there, I'd have gone to jail. The one up there is when I was staying at a friend's camp. You see the socks on my arm? That's so I don't get bit up too bad with the bugs. And I don't know if you see my arms now, but they're still not even healed from all the bug bites, chiggers, everything I encounter from being outside all the time. So my apologies to everybody, but since I am no longer an Orange County Public Schools employee, I can say all of this. I slept in camps. I slept in a hotel, I slept in the Embassy Suites hotel bathroom with the door locked, up by the pool where nobody would be. From about 11 to 5.30 in the morning. I actually, the school over on University, the new school they're building, I didn't even know it was an OCPS school I was going into. I actually hopped the fence from the back and was just looking for a safe place because you don't want to get arrested. That's the only reason. So yeah, I broke in and slept in an Orange County Public School. 
And by the way, I did go back to the gentleman afterwards and said, dude, you got to check out your security. It stinks. <laughs> Been there and done that, dude, too many times. i got to tell you this. There were two other homeless people that were there before me. <laughs> so I, I literally, I tried to stay out of residential areas, but there was one night that I slept in somebody's backyard. Next slide. This is me at the NBC Suites pool taking a shower. I'm gonna get in big trouble while the time the speech is over. Um, this is me in a hotel bathroom, and I honestly don't remember which one, um, taking what we call a bird bath, where you get in the sink and try to get as clean as you can. But the truth is, you can get a shower, you can get as clean as you want, but two hours later, you're back in the 100 degree heat and you are just as nasty as you were before you started. Thank you, brother. <laughs> yes, I went swimming in hotel pools to get clean. I'd dive in the pool, soap up, dive back in again. Because after you can't stand yourself, you're going to do whatever it takes to get clean. And yeah, I even washed up in the fountain at Lake Eola. <laughs> Next slide. I said where I used the restroom, I'm trying to be politically correct. I don't know if you've ever had to really go bad, but I'll tell you this. If you're homeless and you're walking downtown, I only know of one place to use the restroom, and that's the public library. You try to walk into a business with your bag, do you think they let you use your bath, their bathroom? No way. So you are holding it, and if you go anywhere besides a legal place, you go to jail. Try doing it with a dog. So basically, using the restroom is tough. Getting a drink of water is tough. I'm sorry, I have to take a break. What's your name, young man? What's your name? Will, I need you to do me a huge favor. I have a dog that I've been homeless with for five years, and I pull her around behind me on a buggy behind my bicycle. And see, you're talking about behind me on a buggy behind my bicycle. And see, you're talking about things that, you know, if you don't have a dog, you're not ever going to give up on them. There's a whole lot of things. Will, I need a favor. No, 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 no. I don't want you to leave. I want you to come to the front row. Come here. Will, what, when did I say you were being a pain? I'm inviting you to the front row. I have a pet, and there's no help for people with... Sit right there for a minute, and I'm going to talk to you in just a second, okay? Next slide, please. Where did I find recreation? I'll tell you this. Lake Eola is good for a lot more than just going and looking at the lake. They have movies. They have events. I spent most of my recreation at Lake Eola. Um, the other place was the library and parks. That's where I got really good entertainment. And I want to talk about the library for a minute because I want to tell you the story of a young man that I knew. He um, fell asleep in the library three times in three years. So he's trespassed from the library, can't ever go back. Hmm. I don't know about you, but when I'm out in the heat all day, every day for years and years, and it's an air conditioned place, you can't stay awake. Now, am I upset with the library for doing that? No, please don't take it that way. But I am saying three times in three years is not a reason to remove this guy's only contact with his family in the world. Because that's the only place they can use the internet. It's the only place they can go to the bathroom. It's the only place they can get a cold drink of water. 
I'm trying to make you understand that any one of these things by themselves is not a big deal. It's not. It's everything in totality. It's being beat down from the time you wake up until the time you try to sleep because you never sleep. I said earlier that you never felt safe and you don't. If you take your shoes off while you're sleeping, they're gone. If you don't take them off, they stay wet and your feet, I don't even want, I actually was thinking of taking my socks off. They've been healing for about two weeks, but my wife will tell you, you don't want to see them. Between athlete's feet, blisters, and walking 12, 15 miles a day, my feet, it'll take them six months to heal. Now these people are on the streets for years doing this. Years. And we give them a hard time. There's some may deserve a hard time because they were disrespectful. They were, they were drunk when, and, and ruining somebody's party or they, they were doing things that they shouldn't be doing, but the majority aren't. They're never safe. They're never happy. It's amazing. I have a picture of Mr. Noodle up there. And if you aren't following my Facebook campaign, that was my uh, thing. Kind of, I was kind of doing it for the students because I have to tell you that if you noticed in the beginning, I was putting assignments up for my students, but then I quickly got overwhelmed and didn't do that anymore. So Mr. Lou was created to be like uh, Wilson in, in the castaway, okay? And no kidding, he was my best friend. That's not a joke. Every time I had to make a long walk, I'd bounce that golf ball and make the walk shorter. Did I talk to him? No. But did he make my life better? Yes. A stupid golf ball. You want to know why? Because I'd be sitting in the blue box, which is illegal, by the way, I found out. Thank you, Orange. Uh, excuse me, City of Orlando Police Department. I was sitting in the blue box and an officer came up and says, you can't sit. Now, let me tell you the history behind the blue box and why I keep beating it up. Actually, it's not time for that yet. I'm off track. I apologize. Next slide. Okay, so I talked about this already. See, I'm good with my notes, but not good with the PowerPoint. My fault. I already talked about all the things that happened to me physically. Let's talk about what happened to me mentally. Um, anybody that knew me before this adventure would tell, tell you that I'm an extremely hardworking, intelligent, aggressive, crazy man. So, but I'll tell you right now, after 30 days, you can multiply that times 10. Easy. It's given just 30 days. Gave me serious PTSD issues. Just 30 days. And these guys are out there for years. I, am, I was depressed, I wanted to quit, and I'm never a quitter. Anybody that knows me can tell you I don't quit. But none of that mattered. I'll tell you what matters the most, and that is, I was hopeless. And I had an end. I knew in 30 days, this was going to be over. And I was still hopeless. What if there's not an end? Herman Cain, and I don't know if this is his quote, I heard it on his show, I don't know if it's his quote or somebody else's, so please, but he said there's three things it takes to be happy, and I believe he's correct. He said you have to have somebody to love, you have to have something to do, and you have to have something to look forward to. The homeless never have the last one. They never have anything to look forward to. They're hopeless, and they're hopeless because society does not shake their hand, even if we gave them no extra services from this moment forward, if you treated a homeless person with respect, you would make their day. I will tell you this, when I went to food shares, it wasn't about the food. Of course I was hungry, but what I was really looking for was somebody to let me know I was somebody. Somebody to let me feel like a person. Didn't happen very often even from the volunteers.
They're, they're afraid. They're guarding their children from the homeless while they're out there volunteering. And I'm not, believe me, I'm not saying do things with reckless abandon. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, you know, a 22-year-old girl such as Laura should go down and feed at Paramore at midnight. I mean, that would be ignorant. But I will say this. I was at the library right here, right down the street from here on Colonial. And I'm, a, I'm the consummate teacher, and I'm sitting there talking with a gentleman, another gentleman who was homeless. And this lady walked up with her children, and the little girl is right next to me, and mom's right next to her. And she says to her mom, it was so cute, she goes, Mom, do you know there's 60 seconds in a minute, and there's 60 minutes in an hour? Now, the teacher and me just bubbled up. I didn't even think of it. I mean, it wasn't even a thought. And I said... Do you know what, honey? There are, not only are there 60 seconds in a minute, not only are there 60 minutes in an hour, but there's 24 hours in a day and 365 days in a year. As nice as possible. That lady picked her child up and almost ran to the car. That's all I said. Stating effect. So, last but not least, I think you get the idea of hopelessness. Let's talk about what happened to me socially. I didn't go out here with any grand plans of making friends with people and having personal relationships, but that's what happens when you go through bad things together. As a matter of fact, that's the military secret. You know, you can build a team two ways. You can build them via adversity, because when people suffer together, they get close. Or you can build it without adversity. Those are the two ways you build a team. That's why boot camp's the way it is. It is. It's to reprogram people to be a team. That's what it's all about. Next slide. This is where my lawyer gets involved. It really truly is. Because I'll be honest with you, I will not back off. I want to talk first about blood and plasma donation. I'm not going to mention any company, but I will say this. Homeless people are given $50 the first five times, and then the next time it's $25 and then $35, and then $25 and $35 forever. First of all, when you go behind one of these places, it looks as bad as Paramore in the back. It looks great from the front. It looks beautiful. But you get there two hours before they open, there's people sleeping in line. And it's illegal to give blood if you're homeless. Florida law states, you have to have a permanent address and an ID. So if you're homeless, you're not allowed to. These people are wink-winking people through the system that are homeless. I didn't have any problem with that. I'll tell you that. I didn't. I was like, hey, if the homeless can get 50 bucks, I'm not going to say anything to anybody. Why would I take away a bet? One of the only ways I survived, I'll tell you right now, without that $250, my life would have been substantially different. So I didn't want to mention that, but here's the problem that came into play. I'm watching people that can't even stand up, that are knocking people's drinks over, go to the plasma table, and it go into your family's bloodstream. They go through five or six stations. You walk in, they put a little dot on your finger first so they know, and they check to make sure you haven't been in another blood bank. They put one of those, uh, not iridescent, I'm trying to remember, my brain's not working. Luminescent. Thank you, luminescent. And so each blood bank has a finger, so they make you put your hand under it, make sure you're not double dipping places. So you go through that station, and then you go through where they do the screening and they ask you questions and they take your blood prick and then you go and you get your finger prick. And point is, you go to five different employees. I saw not one, not two, I don't even want to tell you how many, people that literally could not even stand up give plasma. That's why that's up there. I hope that goes away. Then when we get the homeless in there, which is about, I'm guessing, based on the line, at least 25-30% of their business. And if you're not homeless, you're somebody that's disadvantaged. You're not giving plasma because you're a good guy and sitting there for five hours for 50 bucks. 
you need the money. Then they give them a debit card that if you call in, it costs you a dollar to find out your balance. And every time you use it, it costs a quarter. What consumer would keep that credit card? They wouldn't. But we take advantage of these people every way we can, every business that can. And we use them and we wonder, why are they still homeless? We wonder, why don't you just get a job? Why don't you... We make it impossible. That's why. And here's, here's some stuff. I'll tell you. You know, I walk into a store. I won't say where it was. Guy has an EBT card. EBT card. Snap card. Whatever you want to call it. With $120 on it. Or $150. Whatever his benefits were. I don't know the exact amount. But we're in a store. He needs a pack of cigarettes. You can't get a pack of cigarettes with EBT card. So what's he do? He says, hey, man. Can you sell me some cigarettes? The guy behind the counter goes, sure. I'm going to put $25 worth of groceries on your EBT card. Here's your pack of 305s. And I didn't see that once. I saw it a ton of times. I walked into many stores because I have a coalition badge on. I'm dirty. I'm nasty. They're not thinking I'm some undercover guy. They're selling single cigarettes, which we all know is illegal. Now, do I want all that stuff to go away? No, how the homeless going to smoke? They can't get five bucks for a pack of cigarettes. But we take advantage of it. The next thing I want to talk about is K2. You know, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and drugs were much more prevalent than they are today. K2, I have seen people on heroin. I have seen people on cocaine. I have seen people that have used every substance possible and K2 is about the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen and it's available everywhere in the city. Poison. These people are so messed up I watched them walk in front of cars. This next thing <laughs> Thank you makes me kind of upset because I would think if you had a washing machine and a shelter, you would get the idea that um, <clears throat> Salvation Army. people are not in a shelter because they want to be there. And if they, you know, if you got a washing machine that costs a buck or a buck fifty and you got to wash your clothes and dry them, that's three dollars you're not going to eat with. It's that simple. So why we would have a washing machine, that's just one indicator. Cheaper to go to a thrift store and buy a set of clothes. The next thing is, I was in a shelter that the lights never went out. Everybody, anybody ever sleep in, with the lights on? No, nobody does. Why? Because you sleep better in the dark. Now, whether they say that's for security or whatever their reasons are, it's demeaning. That's not the only thing. You go in to take a shower, you push a button, it lasts 15 seconds, it stays on. And it's only one temperature, you can't regulate it. So if you don't like it, tough. That's the meaning. Is it important by itself? No. But as all day long, you are demeaned from the second you wake up. It matters. It matters a lot. And finally, we could, at the very least, do a better job of getting information to homeless people. I cannot tell you how many miles I walked for a feeding that was never going to happen, for a benefit I was never going to get. I went to try to go get work at the daily labor pool my first Monday homeless. I found out when I got there, I couldn't because I don't have steel toe shoes. Now how am I going to get 80 bucks for steel toes? Well, the Salvation Army used to give... Um, Vouchers for steel-toed shoes for that reason. Well, what was happening? People would get the shoes and sell them. Why wouldn't they sell them? Would you sell them if you were 12 hours hungry? I don't mean 12 hours from your last meal. I mean 12 hours hungry. If you don't believe me, try it. You'll eat your dog. That's an exaggeration. Not until I'm done, bud. All right. So I'll tell you something else. I grabbed the guides from every one of the shelters I stayed in. And every one of the supposed guides that were supposed to help me um, 
understand what benefits were available and what stuff was available. Most of them, and I'm a reading specialist. I have a master's from Stetson University in reading. So every day in class, I am reading stuff and determining grade level. So, you know, maybe I don't know anything about anything else, but I can tell you this. When we hand somebody stuff with 10th and 11th grade vocabulary and they're homeless, what's the chance they're going to look at it? Zero. Next. <laughs> this, this is where we do the blue box. <laughs> Does everybody see this box? It's actually the same size, about, it might be half a foot off either way, as the blue box downtown. And I want to tell you the story of the blue box. Wow. All right. People avoid it. I want to earn money. So I go homeless Friday night, July 4th, sleep on a street, or sleep on a bench in a park on Tampa Street, and wake up my first night, I didn't even go to bed till midnight because I walked for miles trying to get out of downtown to be safe. And I woke up with a guy's hand in my pocket trying to see what I had he could steal. That was my welcome. Then all weekend I went to every single bar, every single place downtown I could. And if they would take a paper application, I'd fill it out. And if not, I would ask them, can I clean your toilet? Can I do it? I need some money. And it wasn't a joke. Remember, I left Friday night. Now we're Saturday afternoon. I have not a nickel. How hungry was I? How bad did I want a cigarette? Because I'm a smoker. By the way, don't smoke, kids. Don't smoke. I'll never do it the first time. Now let's talk about the blue box. This is, put it this way. If somebody didn't design this as punishment, <laughs> then they did a great job without trying. Because that's what it is. This is what the blue box looks like. It's about this big. And what I did was, is when I went homeless, I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to demean myself to that point. I really thought when I left, I could pick up some job or something that makes $5 here or there. No. Why? Because all the homeless are congregated downtown because that's where all the services why? Because all the homeless are congregated downtown because that's where all the services are. So the business members get hit 20, 30 times a day from homeless. They can't get too far out because like the homeless that live out here in the camps, they have a big problem because they have no resources. They don't have any food shares. Unless somebody brings it to their camp, they got to travel a long way. So they all congregate downtown mainly. And this map, all these dots, or where these blue boxes are. So what I did is I went to the courthouse. Well, wait a minute, excuse me, that's not correct. What I did is I was told you could panhandle in the blue box. So here's how it'd start. I would, actually, this is my sign that I wrote on the back of one of my manuals that I got that I never read. Well, I did read it, but the homeless wouldn't have. Um, now, understand the street is in front of me here and the street is over there. So I would sit there and cars would go by you know, and I was doing really good. I literally was making $18 an hour. But, woo, hey man, you can't face traffic. You gotta face the wall. So imagine the streets here, the other streets here. I'm only allowed to talk to the people between the blue box and the wall that walk by. If I take anything from the car, I go to jail. If my sign is seen from orange, if I'm sitting in orange in central, and, my, and I, I take my sign and it's turned this much, then I go to jail. If I sit down, I go to jail. Now, that, let me tell you, I got stopped by OPD three times before they knew who I was. Then that stopped. I don't know how that happened. But the first time they stopped me was because my sign could be seen from orange, literally like that. And I didn't even say anything to anybody. I would just hold the sign up so I wasn't aggressive. I wouldn't even ask for money. I would just hold the sign. Second time was because I was sitting down. Now, at this point, I'd already gone to the courthouse, looked up the city code, and nowhere in the panhandling thing did it say I couldn't sit down, or I wouldn't have been sitting down. Well, the officer put me on the wall, he ran my name, and he said, yeah, it doesn't say it in the panhandling code, it's in the city code. You can't sit on the sidewalk anywhere. <laughs> and so I went to the mayor's office and I said, hey, what do we do for disabled people? 
How is a disabled person supposed to stand in a box? By the way, all the boxes are in the sun too. So here's the bottom line. This is punishment, no matter how you look at it. It may not be intentional, I'm not saying it is, but it's punishment. The box that's outside on Amelia Street, I guarantee you could stand there for 20 hours and you'd be lucky to see eight people. And they're all strategically located that way with the exception of two. That's one at Orange and Central, and the other one that's right outside of um, Eddie's on, I don't remember the street, but that, that place. Where, where was that, Laura, do you remember? Eden. Eden's or whatever. So though, other than those two boxes, and there's 23 in the city. You also have to pay for a permit to do those. Except for those boxes. <laughs> you have to pay for a pain handling permit to use them. You have to be punished. It's that simple, it's punishment. Next slide. I want those blue boxes painted over tomorrow if I have my way. But we can't paint them over till we find some way for the homeless to survive. Because right now, as crappy as it is, it's that, plasma, and theft. All right, let's talk about these donation stations. I'm going to tell you right now, there are so many people ticked off that I brought this up. I don't care. These stupid things, if I remember right, there's 11. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the figures correct. But let me put it to you this way. There's 1,100 parking meters, and there's like 13 of these. When they want to collect money, there's no problem. So if it was about awareness, we'd have them all over the place like we have parking meters. That's not for awareness. If it was about earning money for the homeless, we would have stopped a long time ago, because I hate to tell you, since 2010, we've only collected $2,000. That's 500 a year. And then we pay a guy $13.87 an hour to go collect them. I don't know what the exact figure is, because I, I tried to nail them down, and I heard they collected them once a month, then once every two months. I mean, every time, I, you, know, you know how that works. But the bottom line is, that's not helping the homeless. You know what that's for? That's for people who don't want to deal with the homeless so they can put a quarter in a faceless meter. Mm -hmm. It's to make the public feel good. In no way does that help homelessness. None. Next slide. I got one better than that one. Last but not least. This is just some pictures of Team A-OK. -okay. Wow. Right on time. Um, this is pictures of Team A-OK, -okay, and I want to talk about that for a minute. Team A-OK -okay is not me. It's not homeless and hungry. It's just a concept. Everybody owns it. Everybody. It's a hashtag for Twitter. That's what it is. Many people on the internet are trying to do acts of kindness. Many people. I'm no different. That's how we solve this. We make people feel better by doing things for them. So. This belongs to the citizens, and as you can see, people in barber shops, that's Greg Warmoth up there, I caught him walking his dogs, because um, I was out talking to a homeless guy, he walked by. Um, one of the supporters at one of my events, and a hot dog guy, this guy is awesome. I wish I had 20 minutes to tell you about this guy, because he takes care of a fam homeless family and gives them chores, and man, we need everybody to be like that guy. Next slide. These are citizens too, though. They're not homeless citizens. They're citizens that are homeless. Big difference. Big, big difference. Next slide. So, thank you for caring, and I want you to keep learning. something. If you think for one minute I think I'm in that class, I'm not. I'm not. But look at this small group of people. That's what I was trying to say. Look at the people that are in this room. I can't make that happen. I didn't intend for all of this. But this group of people that's sitting here right now, they could be in that video next. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Tom, I just have a presentation for you, if you don't mind. School board members in Orange County have these gold coins they give to people who go above and beyond the college. Ooh. And so I've got a 